America's a democracy. That means that when Americans vote for a president, all their votes are counted up across the country and the candidate with the most votes wins. Right? Mmm, not quite that simple. Between Americans going into the polling booths and a winner being declared, there's a thing called the Electoral College. Uh, no, not that kind of college. When she casts her vote, the American voter is actually telling a member of the Electoral College, called an elector, which candidate she prefers. It's those electors who actually elect the president. There are 538 electors in total, and a candidate has to win a majority of 270 of their votes to win the presidency. The number of Electoral College votes each state gets is based on its population. Three votes for a small state like Wyoming, 55 for the most populous, California. But, and here's the key thing, in virtually every state, all the Electoral College votes go to the winner, no matter how close the result is. It's a bit like the way your bill gets rounded up at the supermarket, except we're not rounding up a cent here and a cent there, we're rounding up, or down, thousands of votes. And, unlike the supermarket, the rounding doesn't happen just once, it happens with almost every state. That's 48 times there's an opportunity for a tiny majority, or a huge one, to be simplified into a 100% win or loss. That can lead to some perverse results. Take this from the 2000 Gore-Bush contest. Here's a collection of 49 Electoral College votes, and here's another collection of 49 Electoral College votes. The blue Democrat collection is made up of four votes from Rhode Island, 33 from New York State, and 12 from Massachusetts. The red Republican collection is 25 votes from Florida, three from North Dakota, and 21 from Ohio. You would think because these red and blue votes tally up to 49 Electoral College votes that the red guy and the blue guy got roughly the same number of public votes, wouldn't you? But you'd be wrong. In fact, the blue collection represents over half a million more real votes by real people than the red collection. The 2000 election is an important example of the Electoral College at work because in 2000, the winner of the popular vote actually lost and the loser actually won. So the rounding system doesn't all even out in the wash. You can end up rounding up and rounding up and rounding up, eventually ending up with an Electoral College result that doesn't reflect the popular vote at all. Let's check out what happened in Florida during the Gore-Bush contest. At final count, Florida went to Bush by a tiny margin of 537 votes out of nearly 6 million. That's less than one one hundredth of a percent. But Florida is worth a whopping 25 Electoral College votes. So when it was declared a Republican victory, it tipped the scales to Bush in a huge way. In fact, in 19 out of the 50 states, the margin between the two candidates was less than 10%. Across America, Al Gore actually received more popular votes than George W. Bush, but because of the Electoral College system, Bush won the presidency. So, who thought this system up? America's founding fathers, who were worried that voters weren't well enough informed to make the right decision on Election Day. It was a kind of compromise between the selection of the president by Congress and throwing open the doors to a popular vote. The American Bar Association has called the Electoral College system archaic, and over the last 200 years, more than 700 proposals have been put to Congress to reform or abolish it. There have been more proposals for constitutional amendment on this subject than any other in the history of the United States. But it is still here, and it's still deciding the fate of elections. <laughs>